This is actually a huge story. We've touched on it a couple of times over the past couple of years, but tonight we have an exclusive interview with Grand Chief Wabiska Moskva of the Asman Nation. What is the Asman Nation? Some say it doesn't even exist. And if you were to inquire about the Asman Nation in, say, chat GPT, it would come back and tell you that there's no such thing. The Grand Chief, who also goes by the name of Zane Bell, would argue otherwise. And you can find websites with the name Asman Nation. Now, Zane Bell has been, Chief Zane Bell, has been working to, in his words, restore his, his community. Restore the Asman Nation, which he would assert goes back hundreds of years. Well, back to the 1600s even. But here's the, uh, the core of this issue. This is why it's such an important story. The truth of the matter is there are people out there selling indigenous rights using the Asman name. Now, what I'm about to share with you is not meant to conclusively say one way or another if anyone is doing anything illegal. But is this a fraudulent act? I would say yes, fraudulent in a, in a legal sense, maybe not, but maybe. It depends on who is doing it and under what context. You see, the federal government is, does not recognize these groups doing this. And so while they're selling what amounts to citizenship within their communities, within their Asman community, in a, in a way to help these people become adopted into an indigenous community to protect property rights and to gain other rights as an indigenous person under Canadian and international law. The truth of the matter is this, these fees that they are paying may actually be buying them nothing. Because without federal government recognition, they're really not be availing themselves of any rights whatsoever. And in fact, that is exactly what Chief Zane Bell will tell you tonight. That being said, he has been involved, self-admittedly, with some of these people who are involved with these Asmin entities online. It's, a, it's kind of a complicated issue, but it all relates to the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous Peoples. It relates to the transformation of Canada as it is happening in real time, while First Nations peoples, Aboriginal peoples, <clears throat> and those who advocate for the decolonization of colonized countries continue to apply pressure in order to achieve their political goals, which ultimately in Canada involves land back, land back to indigenous people, to the Indians. And language is important here, as you will find out in this exclusive interview with Zane Bell. So complicated it is that he will tell you that he was actually duped himself. Now, what's been happening is that over the last number of years, these memberships or citizenship cards, they've been sold over this length of time to people who are clearly not indigenous. But this connects to the existence of the Métis people. And an indigenous population, indigenous communities of mixed blood, mixed European and 
indigenous blood here from North America. It creates this question, what is an indigenous person? It blurs the lines. It has resulted in accusations of race shifting, cultural appropriation, racism, prejudice. The federal government in Canada does recognize some Métis communities as indigenous. As a result, the people who have that recognition also have rights that are not afforded to others, non-Indigenous peoples. But what's happening out there is that people who are not Indigenous, people like myself are being told that all you have to do is buy a membership, pay your $50 or your $200, pay your annual fees on top, and you will be adopted into an Asman community. With that adoption comes Indigenous rights. Why is that important? Well, if you're concerned that land is shifting back, the control of land is being shifted back to First Nations in Canada and in the United States and across what they refer to as Turtle Island, which is all of North America, Caribbean, and some other areas in the Americas huge landmass. If you're concerned that the sovereignty of Canada or the United States is being lost and it's being handed back, control of the land is being handed back to indigenous populations, and you believe that um, in the future you're going to own nothing and maybe be happy or not, then some people are looking for ways to protect themselves. Canada has embraced this kind of change. Canada has passed legislation nationally through the federal government to incorporate the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous Peoples into Canadian law. UNDRIP, as it's called, is not a binding document in and of itself internationally, but Canada has made it binding voluntarily under the Trudeau government. As a result, our, le our legal system is being transformed. We actually have now a dual legal system, the regular legal system, plus another path for indigenous peoples to take if they choose to use it as a result of UNDRIP and political forces, I would say, that recognize a disproportionate level of incarceration for indigenous peoples. It's the way the federal government is addressing this. Bottom line is a lot of people are afraid they're going to lose their property rights, maybe lose their land, lose their homes in the face of this change that is coming North America wide because of UNDRIP, and especially in Canada where this United Nations document is actually, it truly is, integrated into Canadian law right now. All Canadian not law now has to integrate with and be compliant with UNDRIP. It actually makes UNDRIP the overriding most powerful piece of documentation. It's not even formal legislation, but this document overrides basically all Canadian law. All Canadian law must comply with it. And we're just at the beginning stages of what is coming. So a lot of these memberships have been sold, but the truth of the matter is without the federal government recognizing ASMIN, these memberships are potentially worth zero. All that being said, on top of that, people who are buying these memberships or citizenship packages are trying to, in some cases, take advantage of other government programs to qualify for grants or job opportunities. And we will talk about that more in this upcoming interview. Is it fraud? You can decide. More importantly, the courts may need to decide because we're told that formal complaints have been 
lodged now with the authorities in Canada and the United States, and that investigations may be taking place. And I need to follow up further with the authorities to get more information about this. But there is a deep divide that's happening now because Chief Zane Bell, Wabiska Makwa, says that when he fell ill, other people who were overseeing these Asman entities took advantage of his illness, he says and began to use his name without his authorization to continue to sell these packages for profit. I think you're beginning to get the picture. And the question is, who's actually liable? Is Chief Wabiska Makwa liable. Does he have any legal liability here? As a result of all this, the Grand Chief himself is clearly in a position where he will be scrutinized for his actions over the last number of years by the authorities. Even though he is involved apparently in reporting some of this to investigators who are working through what would some some would describe as the colonial legal system complex issue i think my prelude to it all maybe gives you a a taste of what this is all about i hope it's self-explanatory but chief wabiska makwa or zane bell his other name will be able to explain this i think clearer for you when we come back on the other side stay with me exclusive interview coming up right after this. The information war is raging. Truth without integrity is worth nothing. Maverick News. Because those who have power and those who seek it must be held accountable. The world is watching. Join our family of truth seekers. Donate today and add your voice to the chorus of Maverick Knights. Donate at maverickdonations.com. Truth. Integrity. It's the Maverick way. Maverick News. The world is watching. Chief Wabiska, Chief Miko, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Uh, I'll, I'll start with you, Chief Miko. Just introduce yourself, and, and then we'll throw it over to uh, Chief Zane Bell. Yes. Hello, everyone. I, I am uh, Miko Hawkins. Miko in my uh, native tongue, which is Choctaw, means chief. So I'm Chief Hawkins. Um, I'm located in the United States. I am also the Chief Governing Officer for International Indigenous Children and Family Services, have uh, met a lot of connections through that. And in doing so, I have met Chief uh, Wabiska here and I'll pass the mic to him to let him introduce himself to you all. Yeah, welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm <clears throat> sorry, I was just about to cough. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, uh, well, Nina Wabiska, with the Nishnakaz and Dodem Makwa, Manitowaj Dadanjabar, you know, it's a nice day. It's a good day. 
um, always introduced in, in native language up here. Um, I'm an environmental biologist trained at, and worked in three levels of government. Last, my last position uh, was with uh, acting senior scientific advisor for Indian affairs in the Ontario region. I worked for Environment Canada and the provincial ministry and also on municipality way back when. Uh, I'm an elder, 72 years old. Um, and I've been trying to reestablish as my grandfather wanted me to do. He sat me on his knee many years ago uh, to reestablish the family nation because uh, uh, the issues of Aboriginal uh, rights back in the uh, 60s was non-existence. It was still very much of a uh, slave camp on Indian reserves. They didn't change the Indian Act until 61. Um, a lot of issues of history of Aboriginal entitlements and Métis were an issue at that time because my grandfather's cousin was Louis Riel and Gabriel Dumont of the uh, uh, Louis Riel Rebellion in Manitoba when the Canadian government uh, decided to take over the plains after they uh, uh, they were working on the uh, the purchase of the Rupert's land from Hudson Bay and all that was was certificate to uh, do fur trade. It had nothing to do with the land. So government bought stolen property, the Rupert's land, all stolen property because the Hudson Bay didn't own it in the first place. So the history they don't teach. And that's basically where we're at at that position now is that they don't teach history and people believe they have rights that they don't have. So uh, that's a bit of an introduction. Um, and I'll let you ask some questions there, Rick. Sure. So I guess we should try to zero in on the, the main issue of the day, which for you is um, what some are characterizing as kind of a takeover of what is, is called the Asman Nation. Can you first of all explain what Asman is? Asman is a name I had to change our community uh, history and, and, and um, family lines to a new name because we had three other corporate takeover attempt by stealing the name of our nation. So I re-registered the nation with Corporations Canada as a management corporation to give the copyright. But as mean, that means Anishinaabe, that's the people, that's who all the Eastern, most of the Eastern uh, Aboriginal uh, communities are, are Anishinaabe people. Uh, some call them uh, uh, Ojibwe and Potawatomi and me and Cherokee, uh, um, um, Chippewa and other uh, Mississaugas uh, and Salutrin is uh, a name from uh, a technology of flint napping, I'm a flint napper, uh, technology of flint napping that was uh, postulated by Dennis Stanford of the Sm Smithsonian. I had a lot of talks with him about the population of Eastern Canada by the Salutrin people coming across the ice sheet from uh, Spain to uh, uh, Newfoundland. And uh, I had a lot of talks with him and he's still doing that research on the Salutrin because of the Salutrin points on the Eastern coast. So I uh, added the Salutrin and then Métis because I'm Métis. I'm a, the ninth, uh, my ninth great grandmother was the Marie Madeleine Nicolette, who was uh, the, the daughter of Jean Nicolet, one of the 13 uh, interpreters from Champlain. And at that time Champlain said, there will be a new race of people, the blending of the French and the uh, the natives and I mean, my whole family line uh, and all the many family lines from beginning of new france from the 1600s were all interrelated the joke is i'm my own cousin 250 ways and counting because of all the intermarriage see the french didn't bring women over at the beginning they brought the field de Wah and field de mer uh, brought some women off the the uh, the slums of paris to give the frenchmen some wives to marry because with all the diseases coming in from DeSoto and in Florida, etc., um, the population of Native Americans was dropping fast because of the European diseases. So there wasn't that many women to marry the Frenchmen, though a lot did, uh, but they're running out of women. So the French brought in women. In the United States, they shipped everybody over the United States to populate. The Brits had a different way of uh, uh, populating their colony. In, ca in Canada, the, 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 the beginning of the uh, 
Oh, the baby bonus was that the trappers and the fur trade, they go away for a year, come back. If they had a baby, they got their year's wages that they would have got for fur trade as a baby bonus. And that was the basis of the ba baby bonus. So because you come back all the way from out west to, to Montreal and, and you could lose your canoe and all your furs. So that's how they populated Nouveau France. And uh, they married the, the native women. And because in childbirth, there's always a concern about having um, a number of children. Most of my ancestors had many, many wives because the women died in childbirth. Um, so the history, people don't know the history of Nouveau France, but I'm a Métis, I'm an Eastern Métis. The Western Métis is all my family that move out West and uh, some were already married with the native communities and other ones uh, married the, the Cree, the Plains Cree out there when they got there. So we're all interrelated. So that's what Métis are. They're a mixed race people or the half breeds. They used to, the word for us used to be called the Le Bastard Canadien. It was the Bastard Canadians because we're, we're mm -hmm. doing fur trade up here versus the American fur trade. And they called us the Bastard Canadians. And then they eventually, well, there was all kinds of words. There was the burnt sticks and on Jean de Terre. There was all kinds of names for Métis, but it eventually it became just Métis. Um, um, and so that's the history of Canada that most people don't know. They don't teach this in schools. They don't teach the the development of, of Canada or Kanata. Uh, the economic drivers of Canada were the Métis and um, did all the fur trade. And so there's a long history there that they don't teach. And that's where the complications come. So when uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, wanted to um, bring the Constitution of Canada from from uh, Britain back in 1982, uh, the First Nations people, the Harpers and other ones at West uh, said, if you don't include the Métis, because a lot of their relatives were Métis, mixed blood, uh, we won't sign the constitution. So he included the Métis and the definition was to be a Métis, you have to have an Aboriginal ancestor, uh, self-professed to be Métis, and then be a member of historic community. They had only two cases of Métis rights in Canada where the Powley case where a gentleman, Mr. Powley, um, shot a moose, tagged it, etc. He got arrested. He was long passed to the Western Gate before he got to court, to the Supreme Court. And they said, yeah, he, his family was in and out of the First Nation there in the Sault Ste. Marie area. Uh, so he had the right to shoot the moose. So that was the only Métis rights issue up until uh, 2004. Then we had the Daniels case. Well, the Ga Daniels case was right after, it was the, the uh, D Grand Chief of the Congress of Aboriginal People in Ottawa. Uh, when the, Daniel, or the Supreme Court was signed, he said, okay, what does it mean to have these three Aboriginal people? You got Inuit, you got Indians as defined by bands under the Indy Act of Métis. What does that really mean? 34 years and tens of millions of dollars or whatever it cost was, we go to the Supreme Court and we get a decision in 2016. Yep, Métis are Aboriginal, but we're going to call them Indians now. But you don't have to be a member of historic Métis community. And that's the big uh, issue right now is that it opens up the definition of what a Métis is. is and there's all these pretend Indians. Oh, I have an Aboriginal ancestor. Well, these people don't prove their genealogy. They just say they're Aboriginal and they're self-professing to be Aboriginal. I don't have to be a member of historic Métis community before effective control. So I have all these Aboriginal rights, which is an error. And that's the big issue about these pretend Indians. They say, oh, I have an Aboriginal ancestor way back when, and, and I, I'm a Métis now. Well, you've never had any association with any Aboriginal community in your whole life or your parents' life. You don't know Aboriginal culture and traditions. You have no knowledge of these things. So how are you Métis, right? And when uh, Pierre mm -hmm. Trudeau and uh, um, René Lévesque, after the constitution was signed, it says, if you haven't practiced your Aboriginal customs traditions and you don't know your history, you've already become part of the, uh, the melting pot, you know, like in the United States, you're assimilated. If you're assimilated, you're no longer an Aboriginal. The other thing in World War uh, I, you couldn't, as an Aboriginal, you couldn't join the military until you enfranchised, which means you're no longer an Aboriginal. You're, you're a colonial, you're a citizen, you're a serf of the crown. 
And so, so that's, when that's that's very interesting. Okay, so first of all, let me just backtrack a bit here because yes. if you look online, um, I guess this is a result of your actions, which is to register as a corporation. Yeah. In order to protect what you're saying is like your copyright, and then there is actually your corporation number. So is that what you registered there? That's right. Okay. So you did that to protect your nation yep. and, and the identity um, under the colonial system, if you yep. will, right? Okay. Now, your assertion is that to define Métis, and it's not just your assertion, I guess it's through legal precedent set through the colonial system, is that it isn't really just about um, linkages genetically. It's it's about whether you're born here, and it is also about whether you're part of uh, a First Nations community, either through not birth first, or not sorry, first, not First Nations. Okay. It's not a legal term, First Nation. Okay, so I, I stand corrected on that. Not can can you clarify this for me? Because I, I actually just I found a video of you online. Um, I've, cause I've actually been looking at your stuff for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's just a very short clip and then I'm going to get you to elaborate on this to further explain what you just said. So this whole idea of racial purity, racial, this racial, that is all, I don't want to say inappropriate. It's just not real, right? People are who their community says they are. And if you are born into a community, adopted in a community, and they accept you, then you're part of that community. So could you just elaborate on that a bit? Because this is what you were just starting to get into. And I yeah. think it's probably at the heart of the matter, really. Yes. Under Aboriginal customs traditions, which most people don't know, uh, adoptions have always been there. Because originally when the French met with the, I'll say, uh, Aboriginal natives, right? Um, you don't trade with your enemy. So they made family making ceremony. And so when they made family making ceremony, they could do trade. And Jean Nicolet, who was the interpreter for Champlain, um, I think there was only 100 people, 150 Frenchmen in Nouveau France at that time. He went to the Nipissing, he went to the Algonquins, he was adopted into the Algonquin land, uh, the Algonquin nation as a full-blooded war chief. And these are the adoption lines, but he also married native and had native descendancy, which I'm one of. Actually, I'm a, a descendancy on his two lines. <clears throat> and that's the adoption process. So when people come into a community, they're adopted in, and it's usually the spouse of someone from that community and they adopt them in. If people come into that community and adopt it, then their descendancy can be considered Aboriginal because the community adopted them. And the way in Aboriginal customs or traditions, if you come into a community and you don't have a clan or any family connection, the, the chiefs or the clan mothers adopt them as their own child until they're, they get their own their own clan or family started, right? There's also an issue of whether you're going in a good way. If you're not going in a good way, you're kicked out. So you're really on your best behavior and you do things wrong that affects the community, you're kicked out. It's one of the words that I think in, uh, in uh, oh, one of the other nations, it's called the walking away ceremony. You're, you're told to leave, you make it back in a year or so if you survive the winter, and if you've done good, you get back in. So adoptions are there in any culture around the world because the clan mothers who have the history, like in the Iroquoian Confederacy, uh, when you come into your manhood ceremony, you got to relate all the names and speak in Haudenosaunee or whatever, Mohawk, Seneca, Tuscarora, or whatever, you have to relate all your grandmother's names back as many generations. One of my my friends, uh, his son had a name, 30, I think 32 ancestors. If you don't get that, you don't pass your manhood ceremony. So you, really the culture is very important. In a Métis community, uh, the culture is a little bit different. You've got, you've got 
your historical Aboriginal family, and then you have your Métis family relatives. So you don't discriminate against yourself that you're part French or Scottish or Irish, depending, or even Spanish and, and the East Coast, it was the, the Portuguese came in to, with the Mi'kmaq. So you embrace your, your cultures, both of them. I embrace both all my Scottish, French, and, and, and Native cultures. And I got many Native lines, and, I, and many of my ancestors were adopted into Aboriginal communities and became important people in Aboriginal communities. So the community is who accepts you as a, a member of that community. And when you look in the Oxford Dictionary, the basis of all uh, British uh, law, a community is a group and a group is more than six, whatever it is, whether it's a tiddlywink uh, uh, community, it's a community. So this is where the English language gets really bastardized and changed and man manipulated for people's usage. But when it comes to Aboriginal rights, which is the whole issue about um, the pretend Indian and sovereign citizen, you have to have that connection historically to an Aboriginal community. It was before effective control as a Métis, but now they've taken that off. Now they're disputing that and they'll probably change it back because of all these pretend Indians. Oh, I had an Aboriginal ancestor, but people don't prove their ancestry. You have to prove your ancestry to have that availability of those rights. Now, when you come down to the rights-based initiative, what are the rights of a Métis unrecognized and, and i talked to you about that before rick recognized means it's a list in indian affairs of who they fund whether it's the political lobbyist groups which supreme court ruling says political lobbyists lobbyist groups can have aboriginal membership but they're not aboriginal you can have people and many of these are 100 percent aboriginal membership but the 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 uh, the political lobbyist group has no aboriginal rights and so that's why some political lobbyist groups have non-Aboriginals in there as members because they can't discriminate in Canadian law of joining a not-for-profit not political lobbyist group or not-for-profit corporation, right? So this is, again, where you get confusion. Well, I'm a member of the uh, this, that, right? And they're recognized, right? Well, you're not Aboriginal. You don't have those Aboriginal rights. And we even had Aboriginal uh, non-Aboriginals in our community because they're supporting us in everything and some of them are relatives and cousins. Why would I discriminate against a cousin who's got no Aboriginal line, who wants to work with me, come to the powwows and all that kind of stuff with me, right? So we don't, but they don't get Aboriginal rights, they get community rights. And you'll see some of the videos I've done. We don't know what those rights are right now because we're still, uh, February 11th, 2009, we put our comprehensive claim into the government of Canada because under Canadian law, you're supposed to sign treaty. And if you haven't signed treaty, those people who are taking our lands and resources have to go to the Crown to be charged with uh, with uh, fraud and everything else. And that's where we are right now, is that you have people trying to take lands and resources, money, et cetera. And that's what's happening right now currently, is that we have these people who are non-Aboriginal. They have no Aboriginal rights under the laws of Canada, nor do they have any Aboriginal rights under Aboriginal customs and traditions, because they are not Aboriginal. They're not going in a good way. They're not following the grandfather teachings and other teachings that we have. Um, and they're just taken over for the money. And where the- cool so when, Right, so when you're talking about the money, there, there are a couple of layers to this th that I see, and maybe you can clarify. The, the first issue is they're selling memberships essentially or even citizenship is is that correct into the asmund community but maybe not in a in a proper way so is there some degree of fraud that may be taking place with some of these groups well totally i i won't be specific to any group if you're selling a membership to get a membership into an organization that can be considered major fraud because it's false pretenses, you're taking money. It's especially on the internet, it's internet fraud. Mm -hmm. But where a lot of them get mixed up, if you're in my videos, I talk about self supporting by our own contribution. We're not funded by the government. So, how would you develop anything? How would you take the cases to the courts? You have to have contributions. It's a voluntary, and it always was before I come back from uh, the surgery. It was always a contribution if you got it. If you haven't got it, 
you still got your membership. And all the membership was is to give people pride that they're attached to a community, just like uh, Costco and Canadian Tire and all these other places have membership cards, right? But when it comes to an Aboriginal community, the government said at one time it was illegal for us to have membership cards in our, our community, but the local Tiddlywings come, uh, Club could have their membership cards, right? But people figured that these membership cards gave them Aboriginal rights, which is totally erroneous. It's a means by which you can get money to develop and pay for the expenses as you're developing a nation. And one of my videos I talk about, it's very expensive to go to the Supreme Court. The Daniels case of shooting a moose, it was over $10 million. Uh, not the Daniels, sorry, the Pauley case. The Daniels case, I have no idea what it costs. But just to shoot a moose, to, to have the legal rights to shoot a moose, $10 million, something wrong in the whole system, right? So the problem that we have here is the government has created um, a scenario where people can create frauds. I'm Aboriginal, I'm creating a nation and blah, blah, blah. And they haven't detailed what it is. While I was away in medical leave with the, the brain surgery and the COVID and other conditions I don't need to talk about, they revamped everything. But what they did up until about a month ago when I- Just say, when you say they, who are they? There's about nine, maybe 10 main players in the, in the ASMIN, uh, as minty now it is, but there's also an asmin of the boreal forest. There's they're all interconnected. They had these um, funding like um, tumult and all kinds of way to get money from three different groups, right? They have the okay. I'll get onto the other part, but sorry, there's just so much, Rick. It's just hard to. It is. Apply. It's wide intricate. It's extremely well orchestrated, as far as I'm concerned, a con, but. As of last year, when I was feeling better, and you can see from that last video, I look terrible. I don't look so good today, but anyhow, on that last video, I was looking really rough shape. But this is what I was dealing with, trying to figure out, but they weren't giving me the information. They're putting all kinds of things into the government in court cases, which I didn't even know about them, right? And they wouldn't give me the membership list. They wouldn't give me access. And they were even setting up an email with as my Wabas Gamakwa at Ask It for Equity. Okay, so they've created a massive big organization to generate funds to go in and it goes into, I don't know where it goes to. I'm not in any So is, is Ask It, but you've been involved with these people for a long time yourself, yeah. right? And only since um, I come back, they were there. Uh, working with my ex-wife, mm -hmm. divorced her in 96. Um, and this lawyer was re uh, um, recommended to me, but I had a couple of meetings with him before I went down to Colorado in 2015. Uh, he was working with this Ask It. So he set up this Ask It for Equity. He set up yeah. this Ask It for Equity Tribunal. I've had no involvement in that. He's been using my name in that tribunal, okay? Uh, okay. And they they're not Aboriginal. Um, oh, clan mother matriarchal council. Okay, I don't know who these clan mothers are either. See, I don't know any information. I'm up here trying. I was told that they would look after the community wise while I was in recovery, and I honestly believe now they're thinking I was going to pass away. And um, yeah, it's it's complicated. I, I, and so yeah, they're selling citizenship or adoption into their community, if you will. Yeah, um, that would be uh, a good representation of what they're doing. And they're asking for donations and everything. And then they're also selling their corporate enterprises, uh, stuff on the website. Um, and sovereigns versus nationals talking about, you know, the... Um, the legal oh, the, arguments from the sovereign citizens movement. Yeah, I guess. Well, there's no um, such thing as sovereigns in in, in Canada mm -hmm. or in the United States. It's it that's all bogus. It's a misinterpretation of the law. Uh, I believe they're selling uh, medicine training, which they can't do. Uh, selling um, 
some kind of a uh, money. Uh, they're also doing a legal class. And uh, what he's trying to say is they're doing a legal course. I believe a gentleman there was doing a full two, three weeks course of uh, law, indigenous law classes based around UNDRIP. And they also were doing a healer's practitioner course for $250 as well as then um, having people sign up for a trust called Tumult that is also being looked into and investigated. All funds that if they were coming in, they should be coming to the ASMIN community of which our understanding currently is, is that Grand Chief and, and he can answer this. I just wanted to bounce in and help him because I understand that as he just said, there's a lot of uh, layers to the onion that's being peeled back and there's a lot of it that is still to be uncovered. The bottom line is, is finances and the funding that has come in has been unaccounted to Grand Chief, um, unaware of where any of the funds are or even the total amount. Uh, but I and yield it just to my call. And, and I just, for clarification, when you say it's being investigated, who is investigating this? Currently, um, Indian Affairs is being uh, spoke with, um, as well as um, RCMP um, on all levels uh, across the border, because this is international fraud, as well as, as he mentioned earlier, internet issues. Uh, they're selling funds through the internet. Um, our last note was that they had started charging $75 to be a member and then $75 to print it out as well. So you're looking at $150 per person for membership alone. And then there's um, other ongoing fees yes, with most of these year. as well. Every year. It was a yearly fee. And as many members have pointed out, you don't keep getting readopted every year. So what was the fee for that they upped it to in February? Um, a lot of things that the members are discussing as well as with Grand Chief trying to sort through exactly, you know, funds. Um, so I would like to say that part of the, as part of this investigation, there is a public notice going to be going out to anyone who did an admin membership fee, has paid anything. They need to reach out and let us know. Um, I know I gave you my contact last time, but there will be a public notice as well with an admin to a tribunal that is also helping look into this that I can send over to you for um, display. So if anybody's listening and they need to report that they paid funds into admin, um, the, please come forward and let us speak with you and ensure that the funds are going in the right place and accounted for as well as part of this investigation. Do you have any idea how much money we're talking about or how many people might have been affected? I yield that to Grand Chief. I know he's been doing a lot of digging himself thus far, but I'll let him answer what he is aware of currently. I yield. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chief. Um, it's very complicated, and because we're this stuff is being investigated by the pro uh, proper authorities, I'm not sure what I'm saying, but it's it's believed to be well over a thousand members recently. They would not release that information to me at all. That was released through someone else in our community that found that number out uh, but it's huge and with all the other stuff they were selling phones as well and they got a new survival kit all this is uh, totally new to me and you did ask a question earlier yes i've been involved with my own family line up until i put that uh, that resignation letter in as i'm resigning that was my my counter to what they're doing so the card deck would collapse and immediately they took my whole family all the history of the nation they took it off the website which i didn't control they they controlled that and there's another gentleman is quasitly trying to pretend that he's the head now he's the grand chief um and none of them will prove their ancestry uh you know, there might be someone who has an Aboriginal ancestry and you have to be Aboriginal in Canada. You have to go by the Constitution of Canada because that's who, who controls Canada. And they respect those Aboriginals based on those criteria of def definition. And the new people that are in ASMIN are in fraud because they're, it's not a sovereign citizen uh, entity, ASMIN. It is an Aboriginal community based on historic uh, uh, family lines uh, and community lines and interrelationship lines. Like I was joking to you early, I'm, I'm with all the interrelations of the Aboriginal communities. I'm my own cousin, 250 ways. 
you have to prove that, uh, especially in a court of competent jurisdiction. So where we have here is there's two things when they're selling uh, a certificate on medical training, okay? In Ontario, there's the Regulator Health Professions Act, which says that the only people who are exempt from that act are Aboriginal healers and Aboriginal uh, midwives. Well, if you're not an Aboriginal, you can't get a certificate from a quasi group that's teaching some kind of medicine. I have no idea what they were teaching. That That's a con right there, and they're collecting money on it. Uh, teaching law when one of the when we're two of the perpetrators have lost their jurisdiction to practice law uh, are, are, are teaching this new law which is all bogus the sovereign citizen movement because it's not based on anything uh, st stating that the UN declaration of the rights of indigenous people give them rights as indigenous people because they were born here well they didn't look at the interpretation that's an international word for uh, the first people around the world who are actually Aboriginal uh, and people don't like the word Aboriginal because supposedly they, they say it means abrogate your originalness. Well, that's not what it means. Um, it, the people don't know the ter the actual words, where they come from, where they originally arrived in the Oxford Dictionary, which is the basis of colonial law. So it, it's a constant con. So you ask me a question, I've been involved. Yeah, I've been involved with my family all my life. And, and that's what th this Asman was based on. My family genealogy is one of the main families of Métis in Eastern Canada and in Western Canada, because they're my relations out there too. Um, and I'm, I've got relations in most of the First Nations. So that interconnectivity is what Champlain said. You have to have that a new race of people. You have to have a whole bunch of people to make a race. And that's my family background. And I'm pretty well related to most First Nations. I've, from the, uh, the the Rocky Mountains to the East Coast, I'm Mi'kmaq as well. I'm Anishinaabe here. I'm uh, Algonquin Huron. Um, uh, I'm Abenaki. You know, it just goes on and on. Uh, uh, but I guess, but one of the keys to all of this is getting the federal government, or even provincial governments, and depending on the case, to recognize your community yeah, community yeah. as as a nation within a nation um as we have with through treaties with other um under the in, royal indigenous Park, populations you're, you're right rick and and after i left indian affairs I, as the acting senior scientific advisor like i said um in 2004 after the the daniels or uh, so the Powley case that's when we had another group steal our name because they figured they could get money from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I changed the name. But under the Royal Proclamation, which was upheld in part one of the Constitution of Canada, we have Aboriginal rights based on pre-Constitution and even after Constitution and treaty rights if we have a treaty. But there's rights that can come later when you go into treaty negotiations. So February 11, 2009, we submitted a uh, comprehensive claim to the United Nations, the Queen, and all the territories and provinces of Canada. Only three provinces responded. Uh, the federal government refused to respond, but uh, eventually, uh, a year or so later, the lawyers from Indian Affairs called up and said, what do you want? I said, well, I don't know what I want right now until we sit down and sit at the table that your law says we have to sit down to negotiate. It's called Federal, federal Responsibility Duty Consult, Duty to Accommodate. You haven't accommodated and you haven't facilitated a meeting yet. And they said, well, we don't have a Métis land claim policy, so uh, you're going to have to sue us. I said, well, I'll sue you sometime in the future when I have the, the money to go to courts because I know that's the, that limiting issue the 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 poly and the daniel case took 34 years so you know, it's going to be a while i'll get back to you so um just before uh the, the trudeau government got got in in 2016 i resubmitted our comprehensive claim and the queen responded in and five five weeks or six weeks government still hasn't responded canada uh, but the uh, the Trudeau government, so I got ahead of myself, the the governor, uh, the Queen sent to the Governor General of Canada 
uh, a note to get this thing going. So under the, the Royal Proclamation, those requirements uh, to negotiate a treaty, if you're on our lands, right? Uh, the Harper government started to negotiate with us and they said, well, we got a problem. We don't have a Métis land claim policy, but we're starting to develop that. And we've hired a guy to do this. Uh, he was from uh, out west. I talked to him and uh, we'll get back to you. So I was talking to the head of the Indian land claims policy and she said, well, you need to talk to this gentleman. So I went to talk to that gentleman. It took me nine months to find out that he no longer worked there. And so the new guy, this is just before Trudeau got elected, uh, he said, we don't have a policy yet. And so when Trudeau got elected, I, I, I resubmitted the comprehensive cl claim and the Trudeau government hasn't responded to this date. And all the letters that we've gone to the, the, to, uh, the Trudeau government, they refuse to negotiate. And they so fired that gentleman who was going to do a comprehensive Métis land claim settlement policy. They fired him. And even get a job when the Trudeau come in. So this is what we have: is we have a government that doesn't facilitate their fiduciary responsibility due to duty to consult, duty to accommodate Aboriginal communities that are there, and the history is there. They've got all it's, my history. They hired me as a, an Aboriginal uh, with Indian Affairs without competition. They put me on an international uh, treaty negotiation with the U.S as one of the two Canadian Aboriginals to sit at this treaty. And we sat on the institution governance workshop to negotiate the treaty. Then I come home and they say, oh, we don't recognize you anymore. So mm -hmm. it's all politics. It's all politics because they're afraid of the, and, and this is my analysis, I could be wrong. Based on the fact that the extensive genealogy that's been done on the Eastern Métis the numbers are staggering and the government is afraid of what it's going to cost them. And that's what the lawyers said to me when I met with them around 2010. What's this going to, what's this going to cost us? I said, I don't know. We haven't sat down and talk. So that's the issue. But Canada is supposed to be a multinational or multicultural country, right? They use the word, we don't recognize you because they don't fund you but we're the only race in Canada has to prove our ethnicity. If well, I that, to... That's really, again, at the heart of the matter, right? It's, it's about, as, as I listened to your quote there that I, I played for you said about racial purity, that's not really at the heart of the matter. It's really about being adopted in a proper way and whether you're born here, but that, and even if I listen to on that website, they have, I mean, even here, if I'll just, I'll just play a little bit of it. And what they're saying really is that pretty much anybody, if you're a, can be adopted into this community. Well, yes. If you're born on Turtle Island, <laughs> then you are indigenous to Turtle Island. The scope of Turtle Island is a lots of fun to discuss, but for now we'll say it's North America, South America, and the Caribbean. And so if somebody's born in Toronto, I ask them, you know, are you indigenous? And they automatically say no. Once or twice in the last year, they've been asking this question. They stop first and go, well, it depends how you define indigenous. And so <laughs> the British Empire, the King and Queen of England and the crown, this thing called the crown, tried to divide people born here by keeping some of them with their roots back in Europe under the European crown system, a feudal system actually, that continued on over here under their thumb and versus the indigenous according to the clan mother. And so somebody born in Toronto uh, is, you know, who's 60 odd years old is just as indigenous as the clan mother. They're born in Turtle Island. So you have allegiance to two nations, if you'd like. It's a free, it's democracy. We're free people. You can be a Canadian citizen with the trappings, paying tax, et cetera, and the benefits of that. Um, okay, I, I don't need to play the rest of it. I mean, look, it, it, if no wonder the government's afraid, if that would make me indigenous yeah, make under everybody. that definition. 
Everybody uh, who wasn't a recent immigrant would be indigenous, but that's not what indigenous means. The Constitution of Canada says Aboriginal people. Indigenous has no wording in there other than the compliance with the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which means those Indigenous people around the world who are the first people of those lands. It's a different, dif different definition. Saying that if you were born here, you're Indigenous? No, you're just one of the colonial subjects of the crown. You're a serf. And that's but, it. So but is, there, is there a path for someone like me to become part of the Asman community? Okay, the, I have another video out there somewhere, you might be able to find it, where I talk about the adoption. There's community rights and there's Aboriginal rights. And I was very explicit in a number of, of videos. You did mention that, yes. Community rights is what the community gives you as rights. You can come in and work with us. You can be with us. We might even let you build a house on, you know, beside me or something, right? And because you're supporting the community. But you can't go hunting and fishing without a license. You can't get the benefits from the crown, <clears throat> no taxation and stuff, living on a reserve. You don't get those rights. You get community rights. You can come in, help in the kitchen if you want. Not that I'm saying you're just going to be doing work, but you may come in and be an educator and educator our people, right? That's a community right to come on the land. You got the same thing in on, on First Nations. You can be barred from going on to the, the reserves if they don't like you. Only those that they like can come on. That's a community right, right? But you don't have any Aboriginal rights. And it's very explicit that even corporations, which I mentioned to you before, corporations under Supreme Court ruling says, you may have Aboriginal members in your not-for-profit corporation like Métis Nation of Ontario, uh, the Congress of Aboriginal People, the uh, Assembly of First Nations, right? And all those ones, they could have, um, they have Aboriginal members, but the those corporations have no Aboriginal rights. So, but the the people who are paying these fees to are become doing, part of an Asman community are doing it largely because they're people with my kind of heritage who are afraid of losing property rights yeah. under UNDRIP, which the which internationally is not binding except that in Canada, the Trudeau government has gone a step further to say, yes, we are going to make this legislation binding. And even though it says in UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration of Rights for Indigenous Peoples, that it is that that document is not meant to undermine the sovereignty of any existing nation state, the Trudeau government has gone a step further to pass legislation within Canada to integrate unilaterally, voluntarily, UNDRIP into our system, our colonial system here. And this is also, I think, where part of the, the, the concern comes from, where people are now worried that they're going to lose their property rights.